this is Dr. S.P. Harsa from Mechanical and Industrial Department, IIT Rurki. I am going to deliver my lecture 30 of the course of the strength of materials, uh, which is developed under the National Programs on Technological Enhanced Learning. Prior to start this course, because in this, you know, like uh, in this lecture, we are going to discuss about the numerical problems based on the shearing stresses. I'd, I'd like, and uh, we are also going to use the same formula which we derived in the previous lecture. So uh, we, we we better, you know, like discuss first. Uh, was that what we discussed in you know, like the previous lecture. We discussed mainly about you know, like uh, the shearing stresses because you see in the previous to previous lectures we discussed mainly about the bending stresses, pure bending is there and then we found that you know like in this uh, any, any uh, beam which is under you know like uh, the kind of loading irrespective whether it is a cantilever beam or a simply supported beam then it is also influencing by uh, the shearing, shearing stresses. And then you see we derived some of the formulas for the shear stresses like tau equals to F A Y bar divided by I Z. So in the previous lectures we derived those things and the, in previous lecture you see our main focus was focus was on uh, you know like uh, that if we have a different cross section of a beam then how we can you know like get uh, the different uh, you know like uh, the kind of shearing stresses at different sections particular. So the, we started with the you know like uh, that if we have a uh, cross section of beam is uh, rectangular then you know like uh, we discussed that how we can get first of all the formula that uh, what uh, you know like the tau is there then we found that the tau is the tau uh, means the shearing stresses variation is always in among uh, you know like the parabolic distribution and then we also concluded that uh, the maximum uh, the shear stresses occurs only at the neutral axis and then they are you know like uh, just when we are going uh, approaching towards the extreme end then it is zero. So we found that if we have a rectangular section then the shearing stresses are you see starting from zero from the extreme ends to the maximum at the middle end and this kind of slope was there and then we also concluded that uh, the tau maximum is always three, uh, 3 by 2 times of tau average that means you see you know like if you want to calculate the av uh, this average stresses also the average shear stresses then we can calculate uh, with the if you know the maximum stress or if you know the uh, this uh, average stress then you can calculate the maximum stresses by uh, 1 by uh, 1.5 times tau average. So this was the first section which we discussed. Then we took you know like the different section about uh, you know like uh, that if we have an I section in which two flanges are there and one web is there in between. Then you see we also you know like uh, derived the similar kind of formula and we found that uh, that maximum shearing stresses are always there you know like on the neutral axis and 95% of these shearing stresses are being carried out by this uh, web. That means only 5% uh, shear uh, stress distribution is there with the uh, this flanges. So that is what you see you know like uh, we concluded that if we have you know like the kind of beam is there and if you are designing the beam you know like, like uh, we have you know like on our roofs and all the, that kind of application. Then we always design the beam with the I section for bending stresses. That means if we you know like if our beam is influenced by maximum bending stresses then it is always better to use I section because it gives you you know like the mass moment of inertia minimum and that too also you see they are always you know like uh, rigid with the flanges and they, they can easily bear out uh, those bending stresses because the most of the searing uh, part is there with the uh, web only means the middle portion. So out, outer part is pretty okay with those kind of application and then the last section you know, like uh, we, we discussed about uh, the cross section if we have the circular cross section in that you see we, we observed that you see it is a, a similar kind of you know like uh, the pattern is there as far as the shear distribution is there again it showing the, the parabolic distribution which has the maximum value at uh, this uh, neutral axis and then you see you know like at extreme corner that means you see at minus r to plus r you see it has the zero value. So if we want to describe those shear stress values then it is starting from you know like uh, this minus r to uh, plus r zero and it has a maximum value at uh, uh, this uh, neutral axis and then you see you know like again the similar kind of pattern is there that how we can you know like describe those things uh, about the bending and the shearing stresses as far as these different cross sections are. So this was pretty you know like the important discussion in those things that you know like if we have the different cross sections then how we can get you know like the shear distribution and the other, other another thing is very important that actually how we can uh, find it out that which area is potentially you know like having the maximum shear stresses or minimum shear stresses so that if you want to design a beam for shear stress then we could easily get it those things that yeah this area is you know like influenced by maximum shear stresses so just put more factor of safety or whatever you see uh, as far as the design criteria are concerned. 
So that you see we discussed. So in this particular lecture now, we would like to put all those formula which we derived in the previous section and you just, we just want to solve some of the numerical problems based on those things. So here it is you see the first illustrative examples here, we are taking you see you know like uh, some of the illustrative examples pertaining to determination of the principal stresses in that because in the last section you see we described that if a section you know like if a beam is there which is under the action of bending stresses and shear, string, uh, shear stresses because bending stresses are always along you know like uh, the longitudinal one and those stresses are basically you know uh, these uh, normal stresses or we can say the flexural stresses. So, it is uh, just along these uh, you know like uh, these uh, uh, x axis and then you see we if at the same time if the shear stresses are there that means you know like uh, we have a section in which this uh, axial pulling is there or you know like the kind of axial stresses are there and then we have the shear stresses then we can go for the principal stresses and the principal stresses sigma 1 comma sigma 2 which we derived in the previous action. The last part of the previous action was nothing but equals to sigma x plus sigma y by 2 and since it is a sigma y is 0, so sigma x by 2 plus minus square root of sigma x plus uh, sigma x minus sigma y by 2 whole square plus 4 times of tau a square x y. So, you see you know you know that uh, if we have a rectangular cross action or if you have any kind of cross action, we can easily get it those you know like uh, the uh, bending stresses which is nothing but equals to m by y m by i into y. So, you know like this y is the distance is there in between the neutral axis and the other uh, the, the flare or we can say you know like uh that kind of whatever the layers are there on, on which we just want to find it out the bending stress. So, through which and you see i is nothing but the cross section what cross section which we are using like if we, for an example if you are using the uh, rectangular cross section then we can you know like easily find it out the i by bd cube by 12. So, with those you know like uh, this bending stresses and the tau you know like is nothing but equals to f a y bar divided by i z based on which uh, you know like the cross section which you are using rather you see we are using the rectangular one or the i section or the circular one. So, based on that we can simply put those formula and we can get final you know like uh, uh, the sigma 1 comma sigma 2 by with the using of this particular formula sigma x by 2 plus minus square root of sigma x. So, sigma square by 4 uh, sigma x square by 4 plus 4 times of tau square x y. So, with the using of this formula one can get easily the principal stresses and also the same time one can easily get the location that uh, how, at what location these principal stresses are occurring that means what is the location of the principal planes. So, that was you see 10 to theta x uh, which is equals to uh, you know like the 2 times of uh, tau x y divided by sigma x minus sigma y. So, sigma y is 0. So, it is pretty easy you see by keeping sigma x that means the bending stresses. So, with the configuration of bending stresses and shearing stresses one can easily get the principal stresses as well as the principal planes all together. Uh, uh, so, now whatever we discussed you know like in the previous lecture about the different cross actions for shearing stresses and the bending stresses and for principal stresses for different cross actions uh, you know like uh, we uh, in this particular lecture our first focus is to you know describe those things with the numerical problems uh, with the certain you know like uh, these illustrative examples are there. So, here the first example is again uh, based on that we have you know like we just want to find it out the principal stresses at a certain location at point A in this uniform rectangular beam. Here on your screen you see we have a diagram which is a simply supported beam you know like and uh, or the entire span of this uh, simply supported beam we have the UDL the uniform uh, uniformly distributed load. So, in that you see we have the intensity of that load at the same time you see you know like we just want to find it out the principal stresses at a particular location and that point A you see you can see on your diagram that at this particular particular point A which is you see you know like 1 meter apart from the left hand uh, you know like uh, this portion. So, at this particular point we would like to find it out that what will be the principal stresses and in that you see we have certain uh, dimensional parameter like you see this is the uniformly rectangular beam. So, now our cross section is uniformly rectangular beam in which you know like the 200 millimeter deep is there and 100 millimeter wide. So, the depth and the you know like the width is given for the rectangular beam. So, from that cross section we can easily get you know like the dimensional parameter that what we need particular for calculating the bending stresses as well as the shearing stresses. And then you see it is a simply supported beam. So, you know like you can see in this particular figure that the simply supported beam of 3 meter length is there and it is carrying a uniformly distributed load with the intensity of 15,000 Newton per uh, Newton per meter. So, now you see what we have we have the dimensional parameter of the cross section that is the cross section is first uh, the rectangular cross section and the dimensional parameter are 200 depth and 100 millimeter plus we have the entire span of you know like uh, this uh, 
uh, simply supported beam is 3 meter and over 3 meter you see this UDL is distributed which has the intensity of this is 15,000 Newton per meter. So now you see we would like to find it out the principal stresses since it is a simply supported beam and UDL is there. So it carries both of the kind of stresses like uh, you know like uh, bending stresses as well as the shearing stresses. So first of all you know like uh, uh, since it is a 15,000 Newton per meter in and it, this 15,000 Newton per meter uh, intensity is spreaded over the 3 meter. So total load is 45,000 Newton, Newton because you see you know like we need to multiply with the 3 meter so we have 45,000 meter and then you see it is simply you know like uh, 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 just there at the middle of the span a uh, middle of this particular beam. So the total span is 3 meter at the middle section we have 45,000 Newton load is there. So you can you know like configure this particular problem in this way or we can say you know like simple just take the section first of all the first we need to balance the forces as well as the moment and with those things you see we can easily uh, configure our reactions and the reactions are at the particular left hand section we have the reaction R1 and the right hand section we have the you know like uh, the reaction R2. So we can use you know like we can easily calculate the reaction by simply equating the forces as well as the moment because under these actions this beam is well balanced. So we have you know like the R1 and R2 values because it is exactly at the mid span and uh, the constant values there 45,000 Newton. So both are equal because both are resisting by you know like uh, this kind of uh, load. So we have the uniform load distribution and you know like it is symmetry from both of the side because it is at the exactly middle. So we have the similar value so R1 and R2 has to be you know like uh, uh, equal value and it is equals to 20, uh, 22,500 Newton. With that particular now our main intention is to calculate the shear force as well as the bending moment. So shear force we again you see we cut the portion of this beam from xx. So once we cut the portion you see now first of all starting from the left when we are starting from the left we know that from this the reaction force 22,500 Newton is just going on upward direction and you see it is upward and this is on downward so we have the positive value. So in shear force we better start from the positive direction because it is you know like going in this direction. So we have shear force at, at, at xx section is 22,500 minus now the UDL is there so and UDL intensity is uh, 1500 you know like 15,000 uh, Newton per mini, uh, base, uh, meter so we need to multiply with the X. So the total configuration at X X X and due to this uh, you know uh, like UDL about the shear forces are 22,500 minus 15,000 into X. And now if you focused on the bending moment then bending moment is again it's kind of similar it is due to the, you know, like the sagging so it is a uh, positive direction so we have the 22,000 into x minus 15,000 into x this is force and it is located at the middle of this x by 2 so x by 2 so we have you see 22,500 this is r1 into x minus 15,000 x square by 2. So now you see here we have a generalized uh, you know like uh, the distribution of the shear force as well as the bending moment all across this uh, entire span of the beam because you see now you can you know like uh, vary the x right from x equals to 0 to x equals to 1 or x equals to 3 so that you can get the you know like this uh, uh, distribution of shear force as well as the bending moment in uh, entire uh, this uh, span of the beam. So here you see if you are and we would like to first calculate the principal stresses only at point A which is uh, uh, 1 meter from the left hand. So you see here we need to keep the value of x e which is equals to 1 meter. So shear forces at x equals to 1 is you know like if you are keeping those things at uh, 22,500 minus 15,000 into 1. So we have 7,500 Newton. Now you see we have 7,500 Newton is a shear force at x equals to 1 that means that point A. And you see the similar the bending moment for that at x equals to 1. So if you are keeping those things 20, uh, 22,500 into 1 minus 15,000 1 by 2. So you see here we have 15,000 doubled of the shear forces. So now you see we have shear force as well as the bending moment at point A where we want to calculate the principal stresses. So now once you have the shear force, once you have the bending moment uh, and shear force so that we can calculate the bending stresses. So bending stress is nothing but equals to sigma b by y is equals to m by i. Since it is a rectangular structure so i is nothing but equals to bd cube by 12. So now you see by keeping those values you see here what we have we have m which is 15,000 because you see it is you know like uh, we just calculated the bending moment. So bending moment 15,000 into now you see here what we have we have y. 
So y is nothing but equals to 5 into 10, you know, like uh, we have already, you know, like put those things here. So 5 into 10 is to power uh, minus 2 because we are calculating in the meter. And then you see it is BD by uh, BD cube by 12. So 12 is coming on top of side. So into 12 divided by 10 into 10 is to power minus 12 is there because, you know, like the dimensions are given here as in millimeter. So we need to, you know, like change into, uh, you know, like in terms of the meter. So this is like that uh, 10 into 10 is to power minus uh, 12 uh, minus uh, 12 into now you see BD cube. So cube is you know like 20 into 10 to the power minus uh, 2 whole to the power cube. So now if you manipulate those things then you have at the end you see that uh, this 11.25 mega Newton per meter square. So now you see we have the bending stresses in terms of mega Newton per meter square. Now for that we can easily calculate the shearing stresses because it's a rectangular structure. So pretty simple you see tau is nothing but equals to 6f divided by BD cube into D square by 4 minus Y square. So here Y as you know like just put this uh, uh, this 50 uh, millimeter or 5 into 10 to the power minus 2 diameter we just uh, uh, this uh, depth which we put uh, 200 millimeter or we can say that it is you know like uh, in terms of uh, 2 into 10 to the power minus 1 meter and then f uh, the shear force which we calculated that is 7500 newton so by keeping those values we have the shear uh, the shear stresses is nothing but equals to 0 0.4 2 to mega newton per meter square. So now you have the bending stresses. Now we have you know like uh, the shearing stresses. So by keeping those values means uh, the bending stress is uh, you know like the longitudinal stress. So it has 11.25 mega newton per meter square and the shear stress tau which is uh, 0 0.025 0 0.0 uh, 0 0.422 mega newton per meter square. So by keeping those values we can get easily the principal stresses like sigma 1 comma sigma 2 is equals to this bending stress sigma b by 2 plus minus square root of sigma square whatever you see the bending stress divided by 4 plus 4 times of tau square x y that is means this uh, uh, shearing stresses. So by keeping those values in that formula we can get sigma 1 and sigma 2. So sigma 1 is 11.27 mega newton per meter square and sigma 2 is uh, minus 0 0.025 mega newton per meter square. So now you see it's pretty easy to calculate the principal stresses once you know the bending stress once you know the tau, uh, this shearing stresses and for that you see we need to get first the shear force and bending moment to get those stress values. So this is a pretty simple processor to get the principal stresses for that. So this was you see you know like uh, just uh, uh, just to refresh your concept that uh, numerical problem was there. Now you see we are uh, dealing with a different problem that if we have you know like uh, a kind of uh, composite beam or the flist beam is there. That means you see if a beam is having a two different kind of material and it is you know like uh, mixed in such a way that uh, it is it has a robust design. And for that you see if you want to find it out the bending that actually how the bending will be there in the uh, different kind of uh, structure because till now we we have used the homogeneous material that means you see a homogeneous isotropic material is there in which you know like in all directions the stresses are pretty sim, uh, 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 equal so for that you see all the bending theory was applicable now we, we would like to check first that if we have a composite beam then whether the same theory is applicable to this one or not so for that you see you know like uh, now the analysis is that a composite beam is defined as one of which constructed from the combination of materials as you see the two different materials are there and for which the the main property of that which we are using to analyze the bending is the Young's, Young's modulus of elasticity. So again you see here if we have a composite beam then obviously for the entire beam we have the two different values or if the two different materials are there then we have the two different uh, you know like values of Young's modulus of elasticity. So for that you see we would like to check whether the same beam theory is applicable or not. So since it is you know like constructed from a combination of material and if such a beam is formed by rigidly you know like uh, bolting together two you know, like timber joints or uh, reimbursed you know, like this uh, reinforcing steel plate then it is termed as the flist beam means if you are talking about a flist, be flist beam then you see there are two you know like the timber joints at the extreme end and, and we have you know like a reinforced steel plate is there in between. So now if we are talking about that that you know like uh, it is a common beam which has a two different material one is the wood and one is the steel then obviously you see the Young's uh, modulus of elasticity is entirely different and if you want to analyze those things that okay the bending is there or the shearing is there then you see the entire you know like the combination of this material with the kind of theory is altogether it's a different so we'd like to check that how we can analyze those things so here the first point 
the bending theory is valid when a constant value of Young's modulus applies across the section and it cannot be used directly to solve the uh, composite beam problems as I told you where two different materials are there because they have the two different uh, values of uh, modulus of elasticity and the method of solution is such a case uh, is to replace one material by equivalent section of the another so which is a very important thing you see because here the two different values of the modulus of uh, elasticity is there and when you apply the load definitely they will be a, a different kind of stresses first different values of stresses second and then whatever the strain will come whatever the deformation is come it altogether it has a different value so now you see when we are applying that sigma by y is equals to m by i is equals to e by r this you see theory is almost uh, invalid for this kind of section so the perfect replacement is that what we need to do based on their you know like the different value of the modulus of elasticity we just want to put the equivalent amount like you see in the previous case as the first beam is there in which the two different you know like uh, the materials are there the one material is a wooden plate one material is a steel plate so we need to replace the steel plate by equivalent amount of uh, the uh, wooden plate so that now we have a, st a same structure the wooden and then you see whatever we want to apply straight you see the Young's modulus of elasticity can be easily applied okay so this is a perfect solution for this so you see here again you know in, in on your screen you can see your diagram that uh, these two you know like the outer parts are the wooden plate and this is the steel plate is there in between that and it has a thickness t so if we are going for the real configuration then this is the actual configuration of a composite beam is in which you know like uh, this uh, uh, middle portion is showing the steel part and the outer uh, outer portion is showing the wooden part but now you see if we want to apply let us say it is uh, you know like the bending moment is there on uh, this particular beam and it is you know like under the deflection uh, or we can say you know like uh, the, it is just bearing the bending stresses as well as the searing stresses but you see if we want to apply the same theory which we applied for a common beam it is not valid in this case as we discussed many times so here what we need to do here we need to replace this steel beam by a uh, equivalent amount of uh, this wooden uh, this uh, uh, this uh, wooden beam so for that you see what we need to do here you can just see you know like adsen diagram that we have this is the wooden part this wooden part which is exactly similar to this particular part but this t dash this is the equivalent thickness of this one in terms of wood so that you see we need to replace this how we will discuss this part but the physics says that you need to replace those things and then you can apply those formula which we applied for a common beam so just go with the concept that you see we need to replace this in which you see that we have the new dimension of uh, the equivalent amount of the wooden of the steel with the t dash and a so you see here you can simply you know configure those things and get the realistic uh, way of dealing the problem so this is one so consider a beam as shown in the figure which i shown in the previous one in which the steel plate is held centrally you know like in an appropriate uh, recess oblique you see the pocket between the two blocks of wood in the previous one the first figure and here you know like uh, it is convenient to replace the steel by an equivalent uh, strength or we can say you know like uh, whatever the the main uh, key features are there just equivalent area of the wood so that you know like we can say that yeah it can be a it can remain the same bending strength that means the moment at any section must be same in the equivalent section and as in the original section then only you see the, uh, the theory or the analysis which we are doing it will give you a realistic feeling about the bending moment as well as the searing stresses otherwise you see if you are you know like not dealing with the same kind of bending stre uh, strength or the same kind of searing strength then probably you see whatever the design which we are de uh, whatever the design concept which you are applying to design the beam always it fails in a proper way so for that you see the force at any given d you know like the d y which we have taken this uh, this uh, small strip uh, in an equivalent beam must be equal to the you know like that to the strip uh, it, as it is replaces that means you see whatever the strength which you are carrying out uh, you know for the analysis it has to be same exactly in the equivalent, uh, equivalent amount of the wood uh, in terms of the same uh, the steel strip and then all you see you know like we can say that yeah whatever the analysis which we are doing that has to be equal so you see here uh, as we discussed that actually the initially when we are talking about the, uh, this uh, <coughs> steel strip we have the you know like the bearing strength the, uh, the uh, this uh, bending stresses is sigma into the real thickness t which will be equals to the equivalent amount of uh, the wood which carries the bending stresses sigma dash into t dash which is the equivalent amount of thickness so that means you see the ratio sigma by sigma dash sigma is the stresses in the steel component sigma dash is the stresses in the equivalent wooden component so the ratio must be you see the sigma by sigma dash must be equal to t dash by t that means you see you know like 
T dash means the equivalent thickness and T is the real thickness of the steel. So, whatever the ratio they are coming, it has to be equal to the uh, thickness ratio. So, that you see whatever the uh, bearing stresses or whatever we can say the shear stresses they are coming in the realistic section, they have to be in like uh, uh, gives you a clear feeling about uh, the real section that okay now these values are coming and uh, based on that we can simply calculate the whatever the stress components in those uh, particular sections. And now you see you know like again sigma as we discussed many times that you know like we are applying the load within the Hooke's law and this under the Hooke's law you see the stress is proportional to strain. So, by keeping that uh, thing in your mind sigma is equals to E into epsilon. So, now you see sigma if you replace the sigma in the first equation what we have we have this epsilon into E that is sigma. Sigma is replaced by epsilon into E into T is equals to epsilon dash E dash into T dash. So, now you this section the epsilon is the strain component in the steel uh, comp, uh, the uh, strain component in the steel section and E is the Young's modulus of elast, uh, Young's modulus of elasticity for steel and the T is the thickness. So, now you can visualize easily that what we have we have you see whatever the strain component is coming forget about that part you see the, uh, this Young's modulus of elasticity for steel is much higher than the Young's modulus of uh, uh, elasticity for wood. So, now you see when we are comparing those things and definitely you see as you can see you know like uh, the previous uh, diagram that the first diagram in this the thickness was very small. But in the equivalent uh, you know portion we have a very big thickness why it has come because of the difference of the Young's modulus of elasticity value. So, based on that you see we can simply get that whatever the different materials are there you know like once you know the Young's modulus of elasticity you can easily replace those things uh, by equivalent amount of the section. So, here you see based on that epsilon E T is equals to epsilon dash E dash T dash and now if you are going for you know like the similarity in the strain if we are saying that yeah since it is a composite beam. So, a strain component or whatever the deformations are coming it is equal. So, if you are limiting that part means epsilon is equals to epsilon dash then we have you know like the realistic feeling about the thickness which is coming due to the difference of the Young's modulus of elasticity for the different material. So, you see here E by E dash is equals to T dash by T or we can say that the real this equivalent thickness is equal to E by E dash means how much uh, the difference is there. So, what will be the difference is there it will come in terms of the ratio of E by E dash into T. So, let us say that is if we have uh, some different value it will multiply with this original thickness and with the whatever the uh, real thickness is there it is much more than the previous thickness. So, that is what you see this concept is very much true if uh, they are uh, you know like going with this kind of relations. So, Hence, you see to replace a steel strip by an equal amount of this wooden strip, the thickness must be multiplied by this ratio E by E dash and steel stress in steel is nothing but equals to you know like the modular ratio into stress in the equivalent wood. So, you see here we can simply get the stress in you know like this either in the modular part or we can say in the steel to wooden things. So, the equivalent section is then one of the same material throughout and the simple bending theory is applicable, applicable if the previous you know like the equations are valid up to certain sections. The stress in the wooden part of the original beam is found directly and then you see in the steel you know like uh, first of all you know like we are calculating those things and then if you put the you know like in the steel uh, which is found from the value of the same point in an equivalent material which is you know like always follows the same relation like sigma by sigma dash is equals to T dash by T or sigma by sigma dash is equals to E by E dash. So, whatever the corresponding stresses are coming they have to be you know like uh, follows the same relation then only we can say that if you are replacing the uh, one, um, uh, one material by another material they are simply you know like valid and whatever the equation which we are applying for calculating the stresses they are valid for this kind of sections. So, the above procedure of course, you see is not the limited to the two different material and, and uh, you know like it can be treated above, uh, but uh, you know like it is uh, applies well for any kind of material component co combination as I told you because you see only what, what we are doing here basically we are simply replacing their equal, equal, uh, equivalent amount of uh, the thickness from one part to another part and the wood and the steel flitched beam was nearly chosen as just for you know like the sake of convenience so that you see you know like it is pretty easy to differentiate in between the Young's modulus of elasticity that ok now this uh, Young's modulus of uh, elasticity for steel is much much higher than the Young's modulus of elasticity for wood. So, obviously, if we have a small strip like let us say for 1 millimeter then you see if we uh, 1 millimeter of a strip for a steel then the equivalent amount of is always like uh, 100 times more than this one. So, that uh, we can easily visualize that ok now if you are replacing those things replace in a 
proper way and it uh, the replacement has to follow the proper equations like sigma by sigma dash is equals to e dash by e or t dash by t like that. So, they have to follow this kind of relations then only these uh, combinations are valid and whatever the equation which we are applying like sigma by y equals to uh, this m by i equals to e by r or the tau equals to f a y bar equal uh, divided by i z they are absolutely valid for this kind of composite beam. So, this is there, but again prior to analyze those things, there are certain assumptions uh, in those composite beam. So, in order to analyze the behavior of composite beam, once you followed those things, now certain assumptions are there. Uh, we first make the assumption that the material are you know like uh, bonded rigidly together, so that there can cannot be any relative axial movement is there in between those. Because once you have any slip or any clearance is there, then definitely when we apply the load, it gives a different kind of deformation because already there is a kind of clearance is there. So, it will uh, end, end up with a different kind of deformation and then the different kind of stresses are being com uh, coming up uh, due to the application of load or moment. So, we have to be very much uh, rigid that actually this bounded, that is what I told you in the very first uh, my sentence was the composite beam must to be robust. Robust means actually they have there, there is there is no chance of any clearance in between these composite uh, these two different materials there, there should not be any gap so that uh, they will not allow you see you know like uh, any kind of axial movement in between these two material because if uh, this kind of things are there then definitely we uh, we are experiencing not only with the these two stresses but also the uh, other type of stresses are there other type of deformations are there and whatever the theories which we are applying there it is not valid for those things so this is this was the first assumption so this means that all the assumptions which uh, were valid for homogeneous beam because you see in that are valid except one assumption that there is no uh, no like uh, longer valid uh, in that sense that Young's modulus is same throughout the beam. So, that is you see you know like only the one critical part was there and that is what you know like uh, for the composite beam need not to be made up of the horizontal layers of a material as in you know like in the earlier example that we are always assuming that you know like uh, this uh, we have a beam and they are just make up you know like made up of uh, the horizontal layers or we can see you know like the flyers are there just we are checking those things and that is why you see corresponding to that uh, we are just taking you know like the neutral axis along with that and we are taking all those centroidal or the another axis is along the horizontal layers. So, that uh, you see in the in the previous cases uh, we assumed th that part, but here you see in the since it is a composite beam two different materials are there and it, it is you see you know in the uh, sort of the mixing part is there. So, in that this uh, assumption is not at all valid for that and for instance is uh, a beam might have you know like uh, this. Uh, stiffing plates uh, as shown in this particular figure. So, you can see this thing we have you know like it is not uh, the kind of uh, all uh, the fibers are well uh, displaced in a proper way. It can be you know like in this particular kind of structure in which you know like these are uh, the steel plates and uh, you know like uh, the different kind of sections are there and if I am saying that this is the concrete. So, you can see the real configuration of the metal structure or we can say if you are going for the microstructure then how the configuration or how the distribution is there of the microstructure within those elements you can easily visualize with this particular diagram. So, if you are talking about the steel then you see it is of this nature, if you are talking about a concrete then you see we have this kind of structure in which you see the Young's modulus for concrete is E1 and the Young's modulus of steel is this one. So, now you see if you want to put an equivalent amount then you see you know like uh, it is altogether different here we have the steel structure of this we have the concrete structure is this and then you know like uh, this uh, whatever the material fibers are coming they are altogether different uh, in that. So, that is what you see the in previous uh, we discussed that if we have a, a common beam then it has you see you know like the uh, the fibers are well uh, settled in the horizontal way, but here it is altogether different. Again you see the equivalent beam you know like of the main beam. Uh, material can be formed by scaling uh, the breadth of uh, the plate material in the proportion of a model ratio and that is what you see in the previous case I told you that uh, the stresses in steel is always uh, equals to multiple you know like modular in the previous case modular ratio into the you know like uh, the stresses in the wooden part. So, modular ratio is always gives you know like uh, the proportion that actually how it is to be distributed in the two different section. One section like in this case uh, you can see on your diagram uh, on your screen that one case is the concrete one case is uh, the steel. So, you see it depends on that uh, what the modular ratio is there corresponding changes are there in their strength as well as the bending part uh, this bending stresses. So, bending in 
mind that you know like uh, this whatever uh, keeping those things in your mind that you know like whatever the things are coming in terms of uh, just by scaling you know like those things uh, it will come in terms of uh, the proportional to the modular ratio these things keep this thing in your mind the strain at any level you know like uh, is same as you know like the both of the material because we are replacing those things and the bending stresses in that you know like they are proportional to the young's modulus and that's what you see the corresponding changes are coming in the equivalent section of uh, you know like the thickness as well as the similar kind of uh, you know like the behavior is coming in the bending stresses so that's what you see the young's modulus is a pretty important uh, aspect as far as the composite beam is there because you see here we are replacing based on the young's modulus because young's modulus you know like is a property of material if you just focus on that which will give you that how much it can bear up to you know like uh, this uh, elastic property and if it, it has a less value that means you see immediately once you apply the load it will go into the deflection means the permanent set of deflection part so we don't want to go in the permanent deformation we just want to keep our you know like uh, the material within those elastic regions so that uh, if we remove the load it comes to its original state so that's what you see here if you are talking about a concrete which is a quite brittle material and if you are talking about a steel so altogether they have a different property and since we are replacing by equal equivalent amount then you see definitely the bending stresses are coming into the uh, you know like uh, these kind of composite beam it just depends on the modular ratio and then corresponding changes are coming like you know like uh, just uh, the stresses of a uh, bending so we need to design accordingly now you see here we have the deflection of beams that means you see in all practical engineering application when we use the different components normally you know like uh, we have to operate uh, them within uh, certain limits that is the co constraints are placed on the performance and the behavior of the component that means you see you know like if you are talking about uh, the uh, like deformation deformation means actually how much deformed uh, de deformed shapes are there under the load, load application but the deflection means actually all those uh, small small components they are replacing from one portion to another portion so now you see we just want to see that under the action of this bending moment or the shear forces how the deflections are there because you see it is just you know like going in a, a various different kind of shapes so how deflection will come into the beams under the action of these things so for the instances we say that the particular component is supposed to operate within the values of the stresses the bending stresses and the shearing stresses and the deflection of the component should not be exceed beyond a particular value because once once it goes beyond a certain value then we have a permanent set of deflected part and then you know like uh, we assume in the perfect bending theory that actually before and prior you see the plane should not be changed so the plane of you know like this horizontal beam must remain same uh, before bending and uh, after bending so if we are saying that the deflection after the under the application of this bending moment and the shearing forces if this uh, uh, you know like the value of the deflection is go beyond certain value that means you see it is going in the permanent set of uh, this kind of deflection then you see we have almost deformed shape of the you know like uh, this beam and whatever the theory which we applied is which is not uh, valid at all so for that in some of the you know like the problems the maximum stress is however you see may not be you know like strict uh, or the severe combine uh, this condition but uh, there may be the deflection uh, you know like uh, which is more uh, uh, rigid conditions uh, hence you see you know like uh, when we found that uh, the deflection which is you know like the more rigid uh, in this kind of uh, condition operation so it is obvious therefore to study the method by which uh, we can predict the deflection of the members under lateral or transverse load since it is you know like uh, this form of uh, this loading which will uh, generally produce the greatest uh, deflection of the beam we have to be very very careful that actually what kind of analysis which can give you exactly the kind of deflection because you know like uh, when we are talking about a deflection then it is uh, you know like a much more uh, a severe problem than the kind of you know like the other elastic deformation is so we need to be you know like very very careful to design those things and for that uh, first of all we need to you know like put certain assumptions and the following assumptions are undertaken in order to derive the differential equation of the elastic curve for the loaded beam because again one has to be very very careful that uh, our or all analysis is just based on the elastic deformation of uh, the kind of beam so here you see the first assumption is the stress is proportional to strain that means the hooks law applies and that's what you see i told you that uh, whatever we are tell, telling about you know like the sigma by y is equals to m by i or equals to e by r for the bending uh, theory or for shearing theory the tau is equals to f a y bar divided by i z all those theories with that concept like you know like uh, that uh, yeah it remains the plane remains plane or whatever the you know like this horizontal uh, parts and all these are only valid when we are saying that the stress whatever the stresses are coming the bending as well as the shear they are proportional to the kind of deformation or we can say the strain and in which the hooks law is valid thus the equation is valid only for the beams 
that are not stressed beyond the elastic limit because once it goes into the plastic uh, region that just I told you that uh, we have a permanent set of deflection that means you see we have a deflected beam. So you see you know like uh, when we are uh, dealing with those kind of uh, stresses which is already being there the deflected part that means more and more stress concentrations are there in that kind of beams uh, then you see you know like uh, the theories are not at all valid or applicable to the deflected permanent deflected beam. So this first assumption is very much valid and we have to be very careful when we applied the moment or uh, shear force is so that we uh, the deformation or the deflection cannot go beyond this particular elastic region. The second which is again important part the curvature is always small because if more curvature is there then definitely the kind of uh, you know like the analysis is not at all valid because the fibers are going into the different region. And you see you know like uh, we just want to be you know like uh, go we just want to the apply and we just want to go be not go beyond the certain limit. So, the fibers are well within the structured limit and you know like uh, we can apply the bending and shearing theory. Then third assumption is any deflection uh, you know like uh, resulting from the shear deformation of a material or shear stresses is neglected. So, which is a very important part you see whatever the deflections are coming due to the shear deformation or the kind of twisting or a couple because you see it, it disturbed the whole of the fibers of the beam. So, you see it is it has to be neglected because if it is coming then altogether it disturbed your you know like all set of the fibers then whatever the bending is coming or the beam theories are there it is invalid in that cases. So, now you see it can be shown that the deflection due to shear deformations are always usually small, but you see it when we are talking about the small deformation also it complicates your theory. So, that is what you see it is better to ignore that part. Now, you see come to the realistic picture that if we have a beam which is under the deflection and due to the deflection you see we have a deflected part. So, earlier when there is no bending you see and there is nothing is there. So, we, we do not have any deflected part. So, we have a straight beam that is let us say A and B and this you see the neutral axes are there for that. But when we are saying that it is under deflection. So, the A dash B dash is the deflected region and we have a small curvature part and if I am saying that you know like uh, this O is my you know like uh, set, let us say the origin is there from there you see you know like the C uh, just we are taking the surface area is D S and which has a radius is R. So, for that kind of reasons and you see the angle is now I here just keep this thing you see the angle of curvature is I. So, with this configuration if I am saying that now you know like uh, that beam which is initially you know like the straight as I told you and it has you know like the AB just horizontal part when there is no loading condition is there, but if uh, it is under the action of any load that that particular beam deflects the position A dash B dash as I just shown you, you know like the curvature path under the load or we can say in uh, just uh, in fact you see uh, we can say that the axis of the beam bends to a shape of A dash B dash whatever the axis are there in between those things now it is taken as in a shape of a deflected part. It is customary, uh, customary to call A dash B dash the curved axis of the beam as an elastic line or we can say the deflection curve then only you see you know like the deflection criteria criteria is a valid criteria. In that case you see just you know like uh, which I shown you a beam bent by transverse loading acting in a plane of symmetry the bending moment m varies along the length of a beam you know whatever you see the, this just along uh, just uh, these uh, bending moment is varies along this particular axis or we can say the elastic line or the deflection uh, line along with that. And you see you know like we represent the variation of bending moment in uh, this, uh, this you can see this particular the bending moment diagrams are there we can easily show that how the variation is there with the deflection of a beam. Further it is assumed that the simple bending theory equation holds you know like the good relations within these deflection part because the curvature is very very small in that sense. So, we can say that the sigma by y is equals to m by i is equals to e by r is also valid for these kind of cases. Now, you see if you look at the elastic line which is you know like the deflection curve we can say or the deflection curve this is obvious that the curvature at every point is different hence the slope is different at the different different points. Obviously, you see the displacement of the points when it is under the action of any kind of loading these deflections are altogether different. So, we have to be very very careful that actually how the deflections are coming at different different points. So, that uh, when you are mapping those points it gives you a clear picture of the curve that actually how the elastic curves are there within those reasons. And to express the deflected shape of a beam in a rectangular coordinates because you see if you are saying that the rectangular cross action is there and now it is under the action of uh, deflected one. Let us you know like uh, take the two 
different axes is x and y. We have you see now since it is in a rectangular section, so we can easily take the two different axes is x and y direction. So, x axis simply coincide with the original straight axis of the beam that has to be there and y axis is just shows the deflection. So, you see when I am talking about the x y region, this x is simply gives you a clear uh, this axis of the beam. So, that you see you know, like we are just flowing with the real axis or the fibers are there in a horizontal setup. But y axis which clearly measure that how much deflection is there, how these points are defle deflected from the, their original point to the real point. So, you see the y axis will simply measure the kind of deflection. Further, let us consider an element ds, you know like so that just of the deflected beam. So, you can see in this diagram you see here this is the kind of you know like this ds is there which is the deflected part here and this is the axis as I told you we are just simply flowing with those things and the y axis if you are talking about this you know like then it is simply measuring that actually how much deflection is there in that. So, these x and y are you know like different measures are there with the beam axis and the deflection part and then you see this you know like the radius of curvature or we can see this horizon or the angle or the DS surfaces are clearly showing that actually how the relations are there. So, for that uh, when we consider an element uh, element of DS uh, of a deflected part at these ends you know like uh, at the particular ends of the element uh, let us you know like uh, just construct an, a normal we just you know like put the normal uh, values there actually which is simply interacting at the origin of this uh, through which you know like uh, we, we have an angle between these two normals are di because the main angle which we are measuring due to the deflection is i. But for you know like the deflected shape of a beam the slope i at any point c is easily defined with the using of tangent. So, tan i is equals to dy by dx uh, or we can say since uh, it is a very very small cur curve path is there. So, tan i is equals to i. So, we can say that uh, the i is equal to dy by dx. So, now you see coming back to the curvature theory we know that when you know the radius when you know the curvature path. So, you can say that the ds which is you know like the small segment is there on the curvature path is equals to r into di. So, now by keeping those values we have i equals to dy by dx we have ds equals to r di. So, with those uh, small curvature theory we have ds is equals to dx. So, by keeping those values in your mind now we can simply say that dx is ds you see th this is small segment ds is equals to dx or we can say that r di or we can say di by dx is equals to 1 by r. So, you see whatever the change is there in the angle within the x domain because we are flowing with the beam will give you the 1 by r uh, you know like the radius of the curvature which is a very well uh, you know like the valid theory is there as far as the curvatures are concerned. Now, if we substitute those things uh, in the uh, you know like i we can get d by d, d by dx. Now, we are keeping those value dy by dx uh, because i is equals to dy by dx in the first segment you see here. So, if you are keeping those things d by dx into i is dy by dx which is equals to 1 by r or we can say that d 2 y by dx square is equals to 1 by r. So, now, you see we have a different relations now that uh, 1 by r radius means uh, the reciprocal of the radius is nothing but equals to d 2 y by d x square the second uh, you know like derivative of uh, the angle domain means or you see you know like uh, these things in the curvature path. So, now coming back to the main bending theory which is m by i is equals to e by r equals to sigma by y. So, now you see what we have we have m is equals to e into i by r. So, 1 by r can be easily replaced by d 2 y by d x square. So, now we have the basic equation of the deflection is m is equals to e i into d 2 y by d x square. So, coming back to this particular you know like uh, this equation what we have the bending moment is equals to e i which is the this uh, rigidity. So, it is known as the rigidity e i into d 2 y by d x square second derivative of the deflection in the y because you see as I told you in the x axis we are flowing with the main axis of a beam, but whatever the deflections are coming it is coming in terms of the y axis. So, the second derivative of the y will give you the exact that how much deflections are there and what exactly you know like uh, the variation is there in the x domain. So, moment is equals to e, e into i the flexural rigidity into d 2 y by d x square and this is the basic equation for the deflection. So, now you see what we are going to do we are basically going to analyze these equations here you know like uh, that how we can get the different position. So, this is the differential equation of the elastic uh, line for a beams you know like uh, subjected to a bending of plane in a symmetrical way and it is the solution y equals to f x defines the shape of the elastic line or you can say the deflection curve as it is 
frequently you know like uh, called now you see here we would like to put the relations between the shear force bending moment and the deflection in our next lecture so you see now if you want to conclude this uh, uh, this uh, lecture our main focus was you see here that if we have you know like uh, the different kind of uh, uh, sections then how we can first of all first of all solve the numerically so we found that you see the numerically these can be easily solvable once you know you know like the cross section of these beams that it is a rectangular cross section or i section or circular cross section and apart from that you see once you know that actually what are the different potential reasons where the maximum or minimum shearing or bending stresses are so you see we solve a numerical problem which was you see the you know like in this lecture that we have a simply supported beam and if you want to find it out the principal stresses at certain location it can be easily calculated if you know the loading condition and the cross section of beam so that's what you see you know like sigma 1 comma sigma 2 which was sigma x plus sigma y by 2 plus minus square root of sigma x minus sigma y by 2 all square plus 4 times of tau x square tau square x y by keeping this particular formula in your mind you can easily calculate the principal stresses at any section of a beam if it is under the loading condition then you see we discussed about that if we have you know like the composite beam then how we can replace that composite by uh, composite beam by an equivalent section which is very very important and then we found that in if you have a composite beam which is which carries a two different kind of material an equivalent section is very very important and it has to be follow the uh, you know like the rules uh, or the relations in between the stresses to thickness and the thickness to young's modulus because young's modulus difference is a key role here and you see how the variation is there you know like in the Young's modulus all, always comes into the picture when the thickness ratios are. So this kind of discussion which we made and the last part was there the deflection. So what is the deflection is there what are the certain assumptions are there for the deflection theory and in the end you see we derived that uh, the bending moment m is nothing but equals to e into i that is the flexural rigidity into d2 y by dx square. So now once you have the relation now we just want to put the relation in between the shear stresses bending moment and the deflection in the next lecture and then also we would like to once you you know like uh, put the relations then we, we just want to solve those uh, relations and then for the different uh, you know like the elements like if you have a cantilever or if you have a simply supported beam with the UDL or point loaded we can resolve those issues for the deflections. Uh, with the using of shear stresses, bending moment and the uh, deflection criteria. Thank you.